12, The Deadly Tube. Bond sat silent, frozen with defeat. He opened his wide black case and took out a cigarette. He snapped open the tiny jaws of the Ronson and lit the cigarette and put the lighter back on the table. He took a deep lungful of smoke and expelled it between his teeth with a faint hiss. What now? Back to the hotel in bed, avoiding the commiserating eyes of Matisse and Leiter and Vesper. Back to the telephone call to London and then tomorrow the plane home. A taxi up to Regent's Park, the walk up the stairs and along the corridor, and M's cold face across the table, his forced sympathy, his better luck next time, and, of course, there couldn't be one. Not another chance like this. He looked round the table and up at the spectators. Few were looking at him. They were waiting while the croupier counted the money and piled up the chips in a neat stack in front of the banker, waiting to see if anyone would conceivably challenge this huge bank of thirty-two million francs, this wonderful run of banker's luck. Leiter had vanished, not wishing to look Bond in the eye after the knockout, he supposed, yet Vesper looked curiously unmoved. She gave him a smile of encouragement. But then, Bond reflected, she knew nothing of the game, had no notion, probably, of the bitterness of his defeat. The Houssier was coming towards Bond inside the rail. He stopped beside him, bent over him, placed a squat envelope beside Bond on the table. It was as thick as a dictionary. Said something about the case, moved away again. Bond's heart thumped. He took the heavy anonymous envelope below the level of the table and slid it open with his thumbnail noticing that the gum was still wet on the flap. Unbelieving and yet knowing it was true, he felt the broad wads of notes. He slipped them into his pockets, retaining the half-sheet of note paper which was pinned to the topmost of them. He glanced at it in the shadow below the table. There was one line of writing in ink, Marshal Aid, 32 million francs, with the compliments of the USA. Bond swallowed. He looked over towards Vesper. Felix Leiter was again standing beside her. He grinned slightly and Bond smiled back and raised his hand from the table in a small gesture of benediction. Then he set his mind to sweeping away all traces of the sense of complete defeat which had swamped him a few minutes before. This was a reprieve, but only a reprieve. There could be no more miracles. This time, he had to win. If the chief had not already made his fifty million, if he was going to go on. The croupier had completed his task of computing the cagnot, changing Bond's notes into plaques and making a pile of the giant stake in the middle of the table. There lay thirty-two thousand pounds. Perhaps, thought Bond, Le Chiffre needed just one more coup, even a minor one of a few million francs to achieve his object. Then he would have made his fifty million francs and would leave the table. By tomorrow his deficits would be covered and his position secure. He showed no signs of moving and Bond guessed with relief that somehow he must have overestimated Le Chiffre's resources. The then only hope, thought Bond, was to stamp on him now, not to share the bank with the table or to take some minor part of it, but to go the whole hog. This would really jolt Le Chiffre. He would hate to see more than ten or fifteen million of the stake covered, and he could not possibly expect anyone to banco the entire thirty-two millions. He might not know that Bond had been cleaned out, but he must imagine that Bond had by now only small reserves. He could not know of the contents of the envelope. If he did, he would probably withdraw the bank and start all over again on the wearisome journey up from the five hundred thousand franc opening bet. The analysis was right. Le chief needed another eight million. At last, he nodded. Un bon gant de trente deux millions! The croupier's voice rang out. A silence built itself up around the table. Un bon con de trente deux millions! In a louder, prouder voice, the chef de partie took up the cry, hoping to draw big money away from the neighboring chemin de fer tables. Besides, this was wonderful publicity. The stake had only once been reached in the history of Baccarat, at Deauville in 1950. The rival Casino de la Forêt at Le Touquet had never got near it. It was then that Bond leant forward slightly. Souvi, he said quietly. There was an excited buzz around the table. The word ran through the casino. People crowded in. Thirty-two million! For most of them, it was more than they had earned all their lives. It was their savings and the savings of their families. It was, literally, a small fortune. One of the casino directors consulted with the chef de partie. The chef de partie turned apologetically towards Bond. Uh, excusez-moi, monsieur. L La mise? It was an indication that Bond really must show he had the money to cover the bet. They knew, of course, that he was a very wealthy man. But, after all, thirty-two millions! As it sometimes happened that desperate people would bet without a sou in the world and cheerfully go to prison if they lost. Mes excuses, Monsieur Bond, added the chef de partie obsequiously. It was when Bond shoveled the great wad of notes out onto the table and the croupier busied himself with the task of counting the pinned sheaves of ten thousand franc notes, the largest denomination issued in France, that he caught a swift exchange of glances between the chief and the gunman standing directly behind Bond. Immediately he felt something hard press into the base of his spine, right into the cleft between his two buttocks on the padded chair. At the same time, a thick voice speaking southern French said softly, urgently, just behind his right ear, This is a gun, monsieur. It is absolutely silent. It can blow the base of your spine off without a sound. You will appear to have fainted. I shall be gone. Withdraw your bet before I count ten. If you call for help, I shall fire. The voice was confident. Bond believed it. These people had shown they would unhesitatingly go to the limit. 
The thick walking stick was explained. Bond knew the type of gun. The barrel a series of soft rubber baffles which absorbed the detonation but allowed the passage of the bullet. They had been invented and used in the war for assassinations. Bond had tested them himself. <clears throat> said the voice. Bond turned his head. There was the man leaning forward close behind him, smiling broadly under his black mustache as if wishing Bond luck, completely secure in the noise and the crowd. The discolored teeth came together. Duh, said the grinning mouth. Bond looked across. The chief was watching him. His eyes glittered back at Bond. His mouth was open and he was breathing fast. He was waiting, waiting for Bond's hands to gesture to the croupier, or else for Bond to suddenly slump backwards in his chair, his face grimacing with a scream. Trois! Bond looked over at Vesper and Felix Leiter. They were smiling and talking to each other. The fools! Where was Matisse? Where were those famous men of his? Cap! And the other spectators, this crowd of jabbering idiots. Couldn't someone see what was happening? The chef de partie, the croupier, the houssier! Sang! The croupier was tidying up the pile of notes. The chef de partie bowed smilingly towards Bond. Directly the steak was in order, he would announce, Le jeu est fait, and the gun would fire whether the gunman had reached ten or not. Cease! Bond decided. It was a chance. He carefully moved his hands to the edge of the table, gripped it, edged his buttocks right back, feeling the sharp gun sight grind into his coccyx. Set! The chef de partie turned to Le Chief with his eyebrows lifted, waiting for the banker's nod that he was ready to play. Suddenly Bond heaved backwards with all his strength. His momentum tipped the crossbar of the chair back down so quickly that it cracked across the malacca tube and wrenched it from the gunman's hand before he could pull the trigger. Bond went head over heels onto the ground amongst the spectator's feet, his legs in the air. The back of the chair splintered with a sharp crack. There were cries of dismay. The spectators cringed away and then, reassured, clustered back. Hands helped him to his feet and brushed him down. The houssier bustled up with the chef de partie. At all costs, a scandal must be avoided. Bond held on to the brass rail. He looked confused and embarrassed. He brushed his hands across his forehead. A momentary faintness, he said. It is nothing. The excitement. The heat. There were expressions of sympathy. Naturally, with this tremendous game, would Monsieur prefer to withdraw? To lie down? To go home? Should a doctor be fetched? Bond shook his head. He was perfectly all right now. His excuses to the table. To the banker also. A new chair was brought and he sat down. He looked across at the sheaf. Through his relief at being alive, he felt a momentary triumph at what he saw. Some fear in the fat, pale face. There was a buzz of speculation around the table. Bond's neighbors on both sides of him bent forward and spoke solicitously about the heat and the lateness of the hour and the smoke and the lack of air. Bond replied politely. He turned to examine the crowd behind him. There was no trace of the gunman, but the houssier was looking for someone to claim the malacca stick. It seemed undamaged, but it no longer carried a rubber tip. Bond beckoned to it. If you will give it to that gentleman over there, he indicated Felix Leiter, he will return it. It belongs to an acquaintance of his. The houssier bowed. Bond grimly reflected that a short examination would reveal to Leiter why he had made such an embarrassing public display of himself. He turned back to the table and tapped the green cloth in front of him to show that he was ready.